Okay, today is February 1st, 2021. This is the DevSync. Uh, we are mid sprint on 19, focused on third party skill development, um, at the environment for doing that and uh, delivering three dev kits to our rollover uh, partner. So let's check in and see how we're doing. Uh, Chris Bear's got his work up there, so let's check in with Chris. <laughs> And his dogs. And my dogs. So, um, yeah, I I got. Um, I'm working on the first part of the Pentacore um, API, which is um, passing the new config value that um, Chris added to the config. Um, using passing that to Selini. Um, at pairing time and storing that and then later using that to uh, to get the device ID at activation time. So that's what these three tickets are all about. Um, they're separated out into smaller tickets, but they're all kind of related. Um, so yeah, I've been working on that. Um, the coding is ready. I'm running some tests now. Um, and once I'm done testing, I'll move on to the next endpoint. But that's what I've been doing today. All right. Sounds like what we expected. <clears throat> uh, Derek? Hey, hey all. Uh, let's see, today I was <clears throat> mostly working on the um, SJ240 uh, feedback that Josh had, has been giving me. Um, and my goal, actually, I have one one board, uh, it's uh, a V5 board here that um, is not being used. So my goal is, as I'm printing this one out, is, um, is maybe to get this one to, to Chris or somebody when I'm done with it. Like, Mine is totally functional. This one will be as well, but um, there's just slight iterations, uh, mostly around printing um, to avoid printing uh, issues and failures. So not so much functionality-wise, but um, so anyway, uh, yeah, hopefully I'll have one of uh, another fully buttoned up SJ240 design. Actually, we should you start using the new the new terms that that uh, Michael put together, I think. What is it like Mike uh, NYC DK3 or something? <laughs> uh, or oh, no, well, no. You can, the SJ240 is still the valid part number. That's just the part number for the. Right. Well, that's just the housing, though. It's, it's guess, the housing, this, would be, yeah. this would be, yeah, fully. Okay. So, anyway, um, yeah, I'll have one of those here and there too um, to distribute to somebody. Um, and then I'll be out of. I won't have any more SJ201. So um, let's see. Uh, Going to have a review with Gaz tomorrow on the postcard and disclaimer sheet. And we can be done with that, hopefully. Although I expect a, a little bit of revision. And uh, yeah, that's about that's been what I've been up to. OK. Oh, actually, there's something I do want to mention. I was trying to do a video for for Gaz um, with uh, with uh, uh, one of the dev kits, a symbol, and I had to flash a, a Pi four, um, and it was giving me this interesting behavior where it, um, you know, I would test it with the the Pi OS Raspberry Pi OS, and it would boot from USB. But I could not get it to boot with our image, our Pantacore image from USB. And I swapped it in and out with the one that was known working. And the known working one uh, worked fine. The known working Pi 4 worked fine with both, both images. So I'm not sure what happened that it would accept the Raspberry Pi OS via USB, but not our build via US, USB. And Gez has mentioned some other idiosyncrasies around. USB boot that we might want to keep our eyes on. Um, uh, did the, yeah. the firmware that you flashed the EEPROM up to, uh, 
they're releasing at a pretty rapid clip, right? So they're releasing like once every two or three months, the Raspberry Pi Foundation is pushing new EEPROM firmware. Uh, you may have two different versions of the upgraded firmware between the two Pis. So one of them that you flashed a while back might be like a November version, and the one you flashed just now might be like December or January. Is that possible? Well, that's po yeah, that's certainly possible because I grabbed a fresh version of the, the EEPROM tool uh, recently. Okay, and um, I, I ran into an issue with one of these Pis that it flat would not bring the Wi-Fi up. Um, but I, I marked the pie bad because it's the only time I've seen it. Um, but yeah, we, we might want to validate that when we are up, upgrading the EEPROM that we're not just grabbing the top of the heap and, and loading whatever's the latest and greatest that we have an actual, like this is the supported version of the EEPROM. Yeah. Right. Sure. Okay. Well, well, we need to sort that out then. It seems like there could be an issue with the latest then. Okay. Right. And can you look, take it for that. on the one that doesn't work, can you can you load Raspbian and then I don't remember the command. You, you should be able to find it with Google really really quick. It's it's a quick command that'll dump the EEPROM version to the CLI and just can yeah. you send me the version. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, it would. Oh, let's not get into it. I'll talk to you about it after, Derek. Uh, okay. Who's next? Josh. I'm building Mark II's as quickly as I can possibly build them with the parts I have available. Um, and then providing feedback to Derek on uh, the places where we can improve things from both an assembly and a printing perspective. Uh, as soon as these last, there's like 15 audio chambers to go, uh, I'll, I'll start printing these enclosures in bulk. So uh, it looks like we can crank out at least two a day here, but with all six printers running, we might be able to get three or as many as four per day uh, of the full SJ240 kits. And then we'll be bidding out or going out to get bids to see if we can find a print farm that's willing to do them at a, at a reasonable price as well. Uh, and then finally, we'll probably be helping Derek to interface with Steve Michon, uh, so we can actually get these get the injection molded parts rolling. Uh, oh, and then the other thing that we're working on is uh, getting in touch with the vendors for components and starting to line up uh, mass production type numbers with a goal of pushing 2,000 units in month one, which is targeted either June or July, and then scaling up at 10% per month from there, uh, hopefully to meet demand. Uh, we're still in a situation where we sold more than we can build. Um, I'm looking forward to having the opposite problem. Well, that doesn't sound like any fun, but OK. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, all right, who's next? Kevin. Well, Kevin's not here. Um, see what I can say about what Kevin's working on. Did you ask him about 207? Oh, yeah. Those, I thought I closed that one. I'll close it now. And the other ones are all in progress. Uh, 257, 259. Uh, he's, he started work on those. Um, yeah, test jig is, it's all, it's, it's all basically going to be part of the test jig system. Can, I, I have a quick question about MakerFab. If we, if we send them, so we're sourcing the, hey, Chris, come talk real quick. Uh, so we're sourcing the speakers in China, yeah? The, no, the speaker drivers are coming from either Parts Express or Madison. But they're coming from China originally. Ooh, they're coming sure. from Derek China. would be able to answer that one a little bit better. Uh, 
Derek, are, is your original? I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, in Shenzhen. Okay, so we're getting the all of this stuff from China and bringing it to the states for assembly at the moment. Um, do we want to start looking at seeing if we can get MakerFab to work with a local plastics place and and actually turn out either them or an integrator somewhere in Shenzhen, get them to start turning out complete speakers and boxes? Yeah, we can talk to them about that. Okay. Yeah, they, they do offer that service. We also, uh, I think. And we mentioned that to, um, to Seed Studio too. We talked to the their head of, Okay, we um, had head of ops in, in the U.S. and um, as soon as we have a package, we can give it to both of them and whoever else and just say, yeah, let's look at this. Okay, we had, we had run into some issues, Derek, about supply, which is why we have two different suppliers for speaker drivers, and uh, Parts Express was going to get us a um, development unit for their version of the timpani driver. Have they shipped that yet? Have you received it? Yes, I have, but I've not had a chance to test it. You haven't had a chance to ring it. Okay. And because it's, not a, it's not a direct replacement. The dimensions and the holes and stuff are different. Okay, um, that's not good. Because the, the second issue is just that there there's a challenge getting those company drivers. Like they're just not the supply is not yeah. I don't think we can get two thousand the, the supply issue, I think won't resolve itself, but it'll become much easier to resolve when we have a predictable order and predictable quantities and just say, hey, this is how many we need here, 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 here. Yeah, I there's a possibility. Yeah. Well, okay, Talking this is not the right time for this discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely an issue that we're aware of. And in fact, it's on my list of things to do here. Um, all right, who's next? Yes. yes. That's me. Um, yeah, so I, I class the user stories done. There's not too many of them, but um, you know, feels like they cover everything. Um, I had a look at Lingua Franca yesterday. Uh, that's all. Did one more little fix, um, but uh, it's all working. The the thing is, it uh, it was an unintentional. Um, incompatibility with Python 3.5. So I think the easiest thing is just going to be to um, release it with 21, uh, 2102 um, and jump straight to Lingua Franca 0 0.4, which just adds more languages and stuff. Um, uh, the I haven't done any more on the um, on the documentation yet, but we've been, we've had a few um, of the kits um, get out to, to key developers and been um, helping them get their set up. So um, that's a good way of testing uh, any assumptions that I have um, of knowing, knowing the system. Um, and yeah, I've just started compiling the new port audio um, with some changes that Ken sent through. So we'll see how that improves the, um, the listener experience. Um, and uh, I've also been getting back to some other community PRs to, to um, try and sh um, push those through the pipeline. I'm sure people have seen the, the chatter in dev with some frustrations about how long it takes us to, to review things, which you know is very valid. And um, and uh, you know we we do need to stay focused on the mark too. We also need to make sure that we're we're respecting the the time that people put into contributing to Microsoft. So um, so yeah, spending some time on that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's very important. Uh, and hopefully a lot of those people will have Mark IIs on their desks very shortly. And so this will kind of all come together. Um, For sure. And Des, did you see my diatribe I posted earlier today? Uh-oh. Uh, I haven't I haven't, I haven't checked this morning okay. yet. It was in yeah, response. Well, okay, there, but, um, but really, um, one thing I'm concerned about is adding a bunch of new functionality to um, 
to a complex system that is not fully tested yet. Um, you know, we're trying to get this Mark II out. And, you know, if we add a bunch of new stuff um, that like, destabilizes, um, you know, and this is going to be in, in people's hands, I was, a little, I was a little concerned about that. I voiced that. Um, <clears throat> a, good, a good thing came out of that, though, is I got a community member ping to me um, directly after they read my diatribe and um, asked me how they could help um, with some of the testing and some of the VK stuff. Um, so cool. I in some directions. And I also, there was somebody who responded um, directly in the dev channel about asking how they can help with VK. So yeah, um, I got a good response out of it, but I was just curious, you know, as, a, as an out, if any, what people thought about, you know, how much new, um, New functionality we've been pushing into core right now with um, with all the Mark II stuff we got going on and trying to get that stabilized. You know, if it will, you know, generate new stuff that we have to worry about. <laughs> um, anyway, well, at the moment, the uh, you know the Mark II is building off that feature branch, so it's not getting any of the updates that are going into into mainline core, which is um, yeah, we do need to address at some point. Um, I thought you were down merging occasionally. Uh, I, I I went to do that yesterday, and there's there's a whole bunch of conflicts <laughs> need addressing. <laughs> so the next one's going to be a little bit painful. <laughs> um, but yeah, we do need to we do need to do that. Um, I should make a ticket to that actually. Um, so yeah, like. We, we do need to get the testing up because, you know, we're still like, you know, when you, it was, a, it was an, a, a wake up call when you did that coveralls, um, or the new coverage thing the other day and, you know, it showed we're at 50% coverage, which I know it's just a number. You can't use that to um, determine, you know, the quality of testing, but it's, a, it's not a high number. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Um, do we have any standards yeah. for PRs and with respect to, you know, their incremental, uh, you know, changes to the coverage? Like, so for example, can people submit a PR with no tests and therefore just uh, decrease the amount of, of coverage? We get lots of PRs with no tests. Um, I, I strongly encourage people to, to add tests. Um, uh, it's sometimes, it's harder than that. Like, it depends what the change is about how easy it is to test that part of the system as well. Um, I mean, I've, I've toyed with the idea of like mandating that, you know, if, if we don't have a test for it, we, we can't merge it. Um, That's where I was going. I yeah. think it's a great idea, especially, you know, the closer we get to putting this in the hands of more people than just, you know, our, our community developers. And, you know, if we start generating a bunch of Mark IIs and people start, you know, when we have a PR that breaks because no tests were added, that's going to be bad. Yeah, I mean, in my yeah. experience, it's just been, if you don't test it, it just doesn't work. No matter how simple the feature is, you forgot something and it will break. Uh, and a lot of that or will be exposed by having a proper unit right test. Now. Uh, but a lot of it won't and will be only exposed in, you know, a system test like the VK tests. So, um, and even if it works right now, it, it may not work when someone else touches the code, you know, in a week's time. And right. yeah, yeah, you can blame someone else for it, but like there was nothing to tell them that what they did was breaking your thing. So right. um, short of having QA monkey, you know, little QA monkeys running through absolutely every possibility, um, every time we make a code change, then test is really the, the number one way. I mean, yeah, so where we are right now is really just the bare minimum of what we can get away with, right? Um, yeah. You know, we, we did a big push last year on uh, and implementing a test framework and system, you know, um, but we didn't really focus on like trying to get a particular code coverage or anything like that, right? And we know we actually, we've only implemented one out of the uh, three phases of the VK system. So we know there's whole mm. swaths of core that just aren't being tested in the VK system, right? Because we did we don't we don't cover the speech to text and text to speech and you know 
those things. Um, yep. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we really need, you know, the community to, to help us out with that. Um, you know, it's, it's great to get new features, but, you know, we've got our hands full with, with getting stuff working as it is, you know, asking us to write more tests is, you know, really not something we're excited about right now. So. Yeah. And that not, was one of my points was, you know, if, um, you know, we really want to make sure, I think we, we fell into this trap early in the company's history was, you know, add new features, add new features, add new features, but you know, if what, what you got doesn't work, <laughs> you probably shouldn't be adding to it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And if your voice assistant can't wake up, respond to a query, and update itself reliably, then, you know. Features aren't going to work anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so enough on that. Um, All right. So, yeah, I, I mean, guys, we'll, you know, I, I trust you to handle, you know, the community appro appropriately. You've been doing a great job with that. Um, but I would fully support if you wanted to start, you know, putting in some requirements on, you know, submitting tests with PRs and that sort of thing. Um, I mean, we will get there eventually. I mean, I don't want it to be a shock to the community, uh, but um, but you know, eventually that's where we have to go. Well, no, I mean, the, the, I'm I'm surprised that's not already a requirement. Like, yeah, the, okay. yeah. If somebody like, for example, I, I talked to the folks out at Neon on a regular basis. They they I, they said last week that they have some PRs in that are significant. Um, but yeah, if it doesn't come with comprehensive test cover, you know, first we need to dock our test procedure and make it available. If we've done that, any PR that shows up without proper text coverage gets bounced for test coverage. And if they want to, if they want the PR included in the stack, you know, they need to provide test coverage. Our, our guys aren't getting paid to provide test coverage for features that we didn't develop. And as Veyer said, you know, we, yeah, we, if we can't get the basic stuff working because we're having trouble with failures and so on and so forth, lumping in a bunch of additional features isn't going to be helpful. I, I, I know that we had been down this path a couple of years back, um, but it sounds like it has, it fell by the wayside either immediately or sometime in the interim. All right. Um, who's next? You. Me. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so let's see. Um, I'm going to be working with Kevin this week on uh, getting the final firmware uh, buttoned up um, and uh, start working on all those issues with respect to lead times on devices that kind of came up earlier in the call. Um, I've uh, been basically I've been working on investment business type stuff this week, so not a lot of uh, um, work on the fun parts uh, today. So, um, but we do have, uh, I did, uh, we were talking with the, uh, the fab for the SJ201s over the weekend, and we got them to confirm or commit to a plan to get everything shipped before the Chinese New Year, uh, and actually get them out of the country before the Chinese New Year, really starts to take hold because if they ship them on the last day and then the shipping company shuts down, that's no good. So, <clears throat> so I am expecting that we will have our, uh, a shipment of uh, a couple hundred uh, boards in here um, probably on Monday is my, well, maybe Tuesday, we'll see. Um, and then uh, we'll go through and do all the, the QA process and uh, flashing firmware and all that kind of stuff uh, here before we send them on to Joe. So, um, so that's exciting. Um, and yeah, that's about it. So that's everyone. Great. Um, Ken's not here today. Uh, he's taking a personal day. He'll be back tomorrow and, um, we'll get his update then. Uh, Anything else that people want to bring up uh, outside of the sprint? Nope. Nope. All right. Well, uh, looks like we're making good progress. Um, the focus, uh, again, this week is on getting the developer environment up and running. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, when the people get their dev kits, they can actually log in and start building skills and deploying them to their own units and all that. Um, 
I was taking a look at the schedule and thinking about just using the Mark II uh, that's here on my desk. And um, I had previously slated the wake word uh, machine learning loop as our next priority. But I really think that we should take a step back, um, again, in the vein of not adding more features before we fix the ones we have. Um, I think we should go for a bug fix sprint uh, next. Um, and just not necessarily uh, UX focused, but you know, sort of like even the level below, like a, a, a level zero user experience. Just like there's a lot of just really basic stuff that um, is crashing or not working. And it doesn't even ne necessarily relate to like the GUI, which obviously has a lot of problems with it right now. Um, but uh, but just the, the core, the way core is responding to things, you know, I think there's a there's an odd interaction between the uh, echo cancellation and actually disabling the microphone that makes it look like the mic microphone is not actually disabled, but it's uh, <laughs> but it is it's physically disconnected, uh, but it still triggers the system occasionally uh, because of the uh, the echo cancellation being applied to no input. <laughs> um, so you know things like that uh, stuff that will really be um, uh, you know get in the way of, of developing. Uh, at a basic level, so um, I don't know what y'all think of that. We can we can think about that. We still got a few days to decide. I think it's a great idea because I think one of the things you mentioned last week that I agree with 100 percent is we don't you know if we can't get precise working by the time this stuff goes out, let's just let's get something that does work. <laughs> and it, you know it did to me. You know it. Did, I think it'd be great to have a runway word listener, but. Um, you know, and have it work really well. But if we can't get it working really well between now and then, we, there's there's other solutions to that. So, mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Uh, okay. So that's it for today. Um, we'll talk again tomorrow. All right. See you later.